And next speaker will be Abel Braxma. Uh, the mic told us uh, a couple of minutes ago that uh, IXSLT 1.0 was uh, 1999 technology. And at the time, and still for some people, it's quite strange programming language. And some usual answer is that it's inspired by functional programming, so it looks quite uh, strange to ordinarily Java or JavaScript or C Sharp programmer. But Abel will show you that in XSLT 3.0, we finally have full-fledged uh, functional language in the form of XSLT. So Abel, stage is your. Uh, you don't have a mic. Uh, no, I don't so have a mic. Have two of them. Uh, I think we could do some sort of parallel. Do I have to? Just put it in your pocket or. Uh, okay. Or like yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Abel Braxma. I'm uh, from Abersoft Consulting. We are writing an XLT3 streaming and distributed processor. And I'm going to talk today about efficient XML processing with higher order functions in uh, XLT3. Oh, let's see if that works. One moment. Okay, never mind. Uh, first, I'll introduce you uh, to the syntax of calling higher order functions and what higher order functions actually are. Then I'll have, um, I'll go a little bit more in depth about function items, partial function applications and closures. Um, in the end, I'll make a giant leap into efficiently processing XML with uh, higher order functions and how that can improve your code or how it can improve your performance. And finally, I will summarize that up. First, a small question to the group. How many of you know uh, higher order functions or have worked with it? OK, that's like 30 or 40, maybe 50 percent. Then I won't skip the introduction. I will just try to explain what actually higher order functions are and what they are doing. There are a couple of definitions about them. One is that um, when a programming language supports first-class functions, it uh, treats functions as first-class citizens. What exactly first-class citizens are, we will see in a moment. The other often heard explanation or definition is that a higher function is a function that accepts functions as arguments or that returns a function as a result. Actually, this came from Schoenfinkel in a little bit of a different kind of German paper from the 20s, and later it was rephrased a couple of times in more modern language. Let's look at a little analogy. Suppose you have a program that um, has a function that signs a paper. And let's see how we can turn that around. Normally, when you write a program in typically XSLT2, you have to write the function statically as an XSL function. And you have to know the function and the name of the function during compilation time. I call that second-class citizens, as you cannot really do anything dynamic about that. You have a function, um, you define it, and you can call that function. You have to know the guy that's going to sign your paper up front, and you, ha you, can, um, you have to know, you have to write everything the function already does, like signing the paper, the ink color, or um, the type of pen that he is using, statically. Now suppose that we turn that around. Instead of uh, giving everything and sending everything to the person to sign the paper, we let the person come to you, the program. The person, the actor, the function, and he will take with his baggage his ink, his tools, and, and, and pen, and everything. This is an important thing we'll, that, he, that he has this luggage, his baggage with him. 
We'll come to that back in a few moments. Now, let's look at the code, how that actually would work in Excel T3. Here you see a function defined, get signatory, and this function defines a new function inside it, an inline function with an implementation, I'll leave that to you to fill in, and returns that function as a whole. Now, when I would have a bunch of papers that I wanted signed, I am going to get the functions that I want to use for signing this paper, and when getting this function, I can use the function syntax that you know in, with the normal brackets. Again, that's why you see the normal get signatory function call with the brackets, and then again, the new brackets to call the function that's actually returned. Now, it is not very easy in practice for people to come over to, um, to your place to sign the papers. Um, only real first-class citizens of the world, like Barack Obama, can manage that and sign a paper with an autograph from a distance, like from Hawaii. And, uh, but in, in functional programming, this is relatively straightforward to do, and you don't have to have all this hassle of, you know, building an autograph or something. So let's look at the function items, um, what these actually are. Here is a let expression. Let expressions are new in XSLT3 and, and allow you to assign a local variable. The return statement actually returns um, the, the, the content of that variable. In this case, I am not returning the variable itself, but I'm calling the function on the variable, and the function itself, uh, excuse me, the variable itself has become a function call. That's why the parentheses are around the um, parameter variable. Here's the same signature, again an inline function, the syntax here is a type-safe syntax where you define what goes in and what goes out. You want an excess integer and you want the function to return an excess integer. So the variable fun is a type-safe function at this moment, a function item. In XLT, you can just do the same with an XL variable. Um, you can write it up in a select statement or in a body and return the function item. Here the function is calculating the square minus one and in the, um, the next statement you see again how you can call this variable and which in turn actually calls the function you defined in that variable. So how far does, it, does this actually stretch? How far are we now having first-class citizens? Here, from the previous example where we defined a function, the fun variable contains the function. Since function items inherit from item, they are just an item type, and since you can apply templates on items, you can also apply templates on functions. To actually catch these function items, well, you can make a general catch-all, a match matching item, but you can also match uh, any function, that's here in the function star, or you can, and you can use the new syntax with the tilde, which is a shortcut for item treat as type. The little dot syntax that you see is the current item. As you know, the dot always returns the current item. In this situation, the current item is a function. So you can, again, use your parentheses on this function and call it. Now, 
If you write a match like that, that catches every function, you don't quite know what kind of functions are passed on. So you might want to use a little bit more um, control. Here I add um, the expression function arity, which gives the arity of a function, which is how many parameters the function actually takes, which selects all the functions that I have created with zero or one uh, parameters. Inside the template, I'm selecting based on the arity what kind of function call I would do to prevent that. I mean, if, if I wouldn't check for the functionality, I might, might get an error during runtime. But this is not really enough to do introspection on the function itself, because only the arity is, of course, not enough to know what a function really does. At this moment, we are not capable of finding out whether or not the parameters are an excess integer, whether you want a string, or a, a node of, of any kind. Also, the function items themselves cannot be serialized. Even if you try to, your processor will give you an error. It's simply not allowed. And functions cannot be compared. So even if you, if you have two exactly the same functions with the same body, and you would want to know whether or not they are equal, you're out of luck. Functions, function items don't have identity. So let's move on to a few more practical applications of functions. Anybody know what this is? Adam? Yeah, right. So currying, as it is called, is a term from Haskell. That's what I say because Haskell Curry is considered um, one of the driving forces or the inventors from Haskell. He wrote about it in his paper in 1930. However, he was so nice to attribute this invention not to himself but to Schoenfinkel. So I think we should actually call it Schoenfinkeling. The process of currying is taking, taking a function of more parameters than, than one, and returning a function of less parameters with a couple of def parameters uh, filled in as a default. Now, we, this, this was already defined like in 1920, but we took a little bit of a different approach in XPath 3. Instead of currying where you just like drop the, the last parameter on each next call and end up with a constant, you can create a new function of every existing function simply by replacing the parameters with a question mark, like so. Here, concat, quote, variable, quote, returns a new function that takes only one parameter and that has defaults for the first parameter and the last parameter, which are quotes. So in this example, let's suppose you have a couple of movies and you want to quote all the titles. This is an easy way to um, create a new quoting function instead of writing a whole XSL function and everything that comes with it. You can just define it in line and when you run this query, depending on your movie collection, you will get a, a sequence back with a couple of quoted um, titles. Remember that, the quote, the, the question mark. It will be very handy and it is <clears throat> very convenient to write some inline functions this way, especially with a function like concat. Now, Remember when I started out around higher order functions and traveling and saying that you have to take your ink and your uh, pen and the other tools with you? Well, 
this for a reason, because when you write this inline function inside a query, and when you call it like much, much later, what happens to all the variables around it that you've defined? Now, the simple way to, to remember this is to, when you write it up, is to think that it always um, will contain its environment. It will always bring everything with it that is defined at the moment you define your function. You have to be a bit careful there when you write things up because otherwise you end up with a very large backpack that you have that each function will have to carry around with it. Now, here is how I would want to write a function that from a book takes its ISBN number. But this is not allowed, unfortunately. Maybe someone from um, the listeners here, maybe someone from the working group can spot it right away. But just as with XSL function, a function does not have a context. So what am I doing here? I'm making an inline function and I want the ISBN attribute. But the processor will complain, there is no context. I cannot get to the ISBN attribute. Even though at the moment that you create the function, it's actually there. So there's nothing to complain about, but that's the way it is. So how do we solve this? Well, we talked about let statements earlier. We can bind the attribute to a local variable. I, let's call that ISBN just for the sake of argument. And we call this variable inside the function. Now remember that big backpack you just saw. This, this context that you've created is now part of the body of the function. So you've created a new function and doesn't matter how many books you have or how, how long that is, for each book that it encounters, it will have created a new function with a new context and in this case with a different ISBN number. So, if I apply this, and I'm catching the functions, in this case a parameterless function, then here, at the moment that I actually call this function, I am calling the function from the moment it was defined, so it has remembered the ISBN. I memorize this myself in a way of consider it like an, an anonymous parameter, that is passed on to the function the moment that you call it. But different implementations can do this differently. Now, I've shown you a few expressions, a few things you can do with uh, higher order functions. Uh, let's move on, on to how that can actually make your XSLT programming more efficient. Here I have to give a little of a disclaimer. The XLT3 specification is still a working draft and memorization is currently under discussion. So whether or not it will make it into the final specification is yet unclear, but we very much hope so, of course. Memorization is a way of, if you have like a complex function that does a lot of things and takes a lot of time and is called with different arguments each time, um, but occasionally also with the same arguments, memorization remembers the previous call to the function with all the arguments that were passed. So it, it's like a little hash table where the key is the function plus all the parameters. And when you call it again with the same arguments, it will return the previously calculated um, result immediately without recalculating everything. The way it is currently specified, we have uh, the, the, the attribute is called cache. You can apply it on XSL function. Um, full caching would mean that you tell the processor to 
every time that a memorized function is called, you have to remember it. It's a very strong suggestion to the process to do so. It doesn't have to, but it is a strong suggestion. Partial means that the, the processor is allowed to um, somehow, when, he, when, when there's too much memory involved, it removes a couple of those earlier entries and will allow you to, to sometimes recalculate, depending on how much memory is available in your system. And none, of course, means no caching at all. This is the default, because the default of current XSL functions is also that there's no memorization, unless the processor might optimize it themselves that way. Now, you might remember that each new node that you create, or each node in a document with the same name, or the same content or text, has its own identity, so each node is unique. If you don't care about this identity, and you just care about deep equalness of a node, like your function depends on the name, your function depends on the, the atomized content, then you can hint the processor by telling that it does not have to take identity sensitivity into regard. This is very important when you're writing a memoirized function because suppose you, well, you just said like full caching and you give all these nodes to your function, then each node is different. So your caching itself becomes such a bottleneck that unless you add this identity sensitive is no to your, um, to your function, you will not get the results, the, the performance optimization that you wanted. Now here you see a little example. Here's a recursive factorial that might take some time to, to process. If you want to optimize that, you can give the, the, the caching argument which memorizes the results. So, well, here we see this, this nice concat function again. Uh, suppose I want to know all the factorials from 0 to 100. And then the first time when 0, 1 or 2 have been calculated, it will remember that because I already gave the argument 0, I already gave the argument 1, 2 and 3. So by the time it gets to some higher ones, it does not have to recalculate every previous step again. It can simply um, call the previous entry that it, that it stored and make only one calculation with the new number. Now, let's move on to a little bit more elaborate example, Fibonacci numbers, which we know from nature in different ways, like this nice uh, shell, shell here. When you write a trivious, trivial implementation of Fibonacci numbers, then even with small numbers, like 30 or 40, you might already run into that darn stack overflow exception. And there are things you can do about it, but it takes quite some effort. Now, with the passing of uh, functions as function items, you can do something quite advanced now with XLT. You can uh, rewrite your function that has multiple, ret uh, multiple recursive um, return statements into a continuation passing style function. With a continuation passing style, you trade stack space for heap space because you, you, you create a new function that has only one exit point, one, one recursive exit point, and your processor can make it till uh, call optimized. And once it's till call optimized, there's no way you can run out of stack, stack space anymore. The biggest problem that I find with continuation is they are relatively difficult to, you know, to, to get your mind around them to, and to, to master them. So how would that look? Well, this is the standard Fibonacci sequence, the function that you might have written yourself someday, um, which will run out of stack space pretty soon. And this is 
the same function. However, this time we have rewritten it with an extra argument, an accumulator. This accumulator is a function itself and makes use, makes heavy use of the closures it defines each time. In the, in the else statement, where the recursion actually happens, we call the recursive function the recursion only once. And by calling it only once, the processor can till optimize it. However, to make this work, we will have to um, pass the function the, the, um, uh, again on it, which is the accumulator, the, the counting function, whatever you want to, to call it. And since we need two of them, we have to do that one more time. Because in that function that we passed on, we, create, we call um, the Fibonacci function again. And finally, it calls the, um, the counting function itself. Now, because I'm almost out of time, I can't talk too long about this particular example. Um, but you may look it up in the paper and, and try it out yourself. However, at this moment, both my own processor and Saxon um, trips over this still call optimization combined with uh, complex closures, but that will be fixed in, um, in a short time, I hope. Well, there was someone yesterday that told me that once you start to understand monads, there's no way that you can explain them to others. They call that the curse of the monads or something, or the monads curse. The continuation function, if you follow that and if you actually grasp that idea, you're already using a certain type of monad. I'm not going to go into the rest of the, the monad discussion here because of the curse. I probably won't be able to explain it anyway. And like I'm getting only like two minutes left. I won't be able to explain it in these two minutes either. So let's summarize it up. We've seen that functions are now really first class citizens. We can give them to other functions. We can create new functions. We can return functions from an existing function. We can even uh, match templates on functions. This gives us new tools, new ways of improving our coding efficiency. Sometimes it just makes the coding easier, like you saw with the concat function, and other times it creates a new range of optimization techniques that you can use to solve problems that were otherwise very hard to solve because of the recursive, um, uh, the, the, the stack overflow problem, or because of the uh, memorization problem where you just the process takes too long to recalculate it each time again. Thank you. Still time for questions? Still time for questions. Probably not about monads and uh, closures. So, anyone? Maybe it well, was not true that uh, 40 people uh, tried, 40% uh, people tried to use <laughs> functional program before. Maybe uh, everybody yeah, just understands there, everything. Yeah. Wait for a microphone, please. Okay. One of the things I worry about happening, and I'm not sure how much this is happening, is that we're going to get two communities of XSLT programmers, two communities of XQuery programmers, those who do anything they can using higher order functions, and those who have no idea how to read that code. Um, do you have any comments on, you know, I also don't see a whole lot of useful tutorials telling people when and how to use higher order functions productively in these languages. Um, how do we avoid that happening? Well, I think you can never really avoid that some people that don't want to delve into new technology or new functionality or new tools. Um, if they don't want to, you, you can't really force them to. But if you want to move forward in any IT or, or technology, 
then you'll have to um, educate yourself every now and then with the new and upcoming uh, technologies. However, higher order functions is nothing new, really. So many people, like people that may have worked with uh, C Sharp and link queries, or people that have worked with functional languages, people that, um, is there something hissing? Uh, th th they may have used it in practice already, and they m may find that using higher order functions in practice is not that hard. Try for anybody who is like anxious to, uh, like a bit, of, a bit afraid to start using higher order functions, I would invite to have a look at the map function, um, which is a relatively simple new function of XPath 3. It takes a function and applies that function to each item in a sequence and returns the, um, the new calculated sequence. It will make your code easier to write and maybe even easier to read. Just try it out. Any other questions? Yeah, we have still time for one last question. Yeah. Right. Um, just a comment on that. Uh, I, I'm not even sure we want to prevent that situation to happen. Um, because if I write a library using a uh, functional paradigm, I don't want to prevent anyone to use it. Uh, um, anyone can use it, and that uh, those two different styles of programming can co uh, coexist without any problem. Yeah, you mean it can that's, co not, that's not really a question. <laughs> you mean it can coexist with, without too much problem, yeah. because somebody who writes the library um, has all the knowledge, but somebody using the library might not really have to know that much of it. Exactly, and that's still the same language. Yeah. Yeah, and writing these little inline functions that I showed you earlier, it's quite easy to do. It, and when you have a library that takes higher order functions, um, you won't find it too hard to use. Yeah, anyway, still 50% of ISOD programmers doesn't understand the apply template. Uh, even 50% of ISOD average programmers doesn't understand how apply templates work. Properly, so. <laughs> yeah, but, but maybe that's the same group that will understand higher order functions. Yeah. Then it all fits nicely together, right? So thank you again, Abel, for a pleasant presentation. You're welcome.